If you're having difficulty treating SIBO, make sure you tune in because I'm going to discuss a topic that's extremely relevant to treating this condition and finally healing your gut. What's up and welcome to the video. I'm Dr. Daniel Ricciardi, gut health expert, licensed pharmacist, fitness enthusiast, creator of SIBO Shortcut and founder of Bloat Blocker. This video is going to provide the most important information on a not so well-known topic that often results in antibiotics and antimicrobial herbs not working or not working as well as they could when doing treatments for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or intestinal methanogen overgrowth. I'm talking about biofilms. This video is going to answer the questions. One, what are biofilms? Two, how do biofilms form? Three, how do biofilms actually affect us? Four, should you always address biofilms? And then five, what are the supplement options for dealing with biofilms? First up, what are biofilms? Biofilms are groups of tiny microorganisms that band together in a slimy layer. And this is commonly done on some sort of surface, but they can also be free floating. Biofilms act different than single individual microbes, allowing them to grow in special ways that help them survive, such as resisting antibiotics or other threats. Most notably, when talking about SIBO and other gut infections, these biofilms can actually form on the mucus layer that protects our intestine. While some biofilms are completely harmless and others are even helpful, stick around to the end of the video as I'm going to talk about one instance where this can be possible. Many other biofilms biofilms can cause diseases when they exist and expand on our gut linings. Biofilms are associated with a variety of gastrointestinal disorders. This review by the Journal of Gastroenterology in 2024 lists some of them right here, such as peptic ulcer disease, inflammatory bowel disease, and even irritable bowel syndrome, which is an extremely common cause of SIBO. And if you're trying to treat SIBO and are looking for a more structured approach, check out my online program, SIBO Shortcut. In it, you get all my top recommendations as well as support by me in my private Facebook group, which is a fast growing community of like minded people working together to get rid of SIBO. Click the SIBO shortcut link below to learn more and join. On to question number two, where are biofilms found? Looking at this image right here, if you take a look on the right side, there's biofilm abundance. So these areas are located starting all the way in the top where there's the most biofilms, which number one is the cecum. The cecum is the very beginning portion of the large intestines. It's the portion of the large intestines that's closest to the small intestine. In this diagram, it's on the lower left side. And then the ileum is the next highest spot with the most biofilms. So the ileum is the ending portion of the small intestine or the portion of the small intestine that is closest to the large intestine. These biofilms start when bacteria gather together and attach to surfaces in the human body, such as the intestinal lining. Then they start producing this protective layer, which is known as EPS or extracellular polymeric substances. This is made up of different types of sugars, proteins, lipids, and even special types of DNA. This EPS layer helps the bacteria form and communicate within that community. And when these biofilms grow, they become much stronger and more complex, making them more resistant to things such as antibiotics and antimicrobial herbs. When a biofilm becomes large enough, eventually part of it can break off and spread to new areas in the intestine, forming a new biofilm and continuing this cycle. This photo right here is a graphical representation of what basically happens. As you see on the left, step one initiation the bacteria bind to what is the mucus layer on the intestinal membrane the biofilm continues to develop and eventually disperses a new biofilm bubble that goes on and attaches to a different part of the intestinal lining effectively spreading out and if this is done by harmful bacteria it's essentially spreading the infection one thing i do want to point out on these biofilms is a special type of cell if you look on step number two there's these cells called persister cells these are cells that are at the very underneath part of the biofilm and because they're there, they don't get as much food and they typically tend to lie dormant, meaning they're not replicating. Because of this, these persister cells can be especially hard to kill if you're using antibiotics or antimicrobial herbs. They can also be more responsible for relapses in SIBO and other gut infections. So this is one particular reason why addressing biofilms can be particularly important. Question number three now, how do biofilms actually affect us? Per this 2024 review by the Journal of Gastroenterology, the matrix protects against host defense mechanisms mechanical forces of intestinal peristalsis and antimicrobials through slow or incomplete drug penetration. I talked about antibiotics not working. This is also talking about the normal gut motility that typically will flush bacteria through the small intestine. If there's biofilms, this does not work as well. It goes on to say here, biofilm cells being up to 1000 fold more protected than their planktonic counterparts. Planktonic counterparts just means that they're free flowing bacteria in the intestine. Continuing with how biofilms affect us, this 2021 report 
talks about the prevalence of bile films in gut disorders. It says a recent clinical study revealed endoscopically visible mucosal bile films in 57% of IBS patients, as well as 34% of ulcerative colitis and 22% of Crohn's disease patients. And they were only present in 6% of healthy patients. This was done in a study of over a thousand people. It goes on to say that the biofilm positive ulcerative colitis in IBS patients had altered microbiome compared with biofilm negative individuals. In recent years, it's become more accepted that a major, major cause of IBS is actually SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So to see that 57% of these patients that have IBS also had biofilms, that's a very telling statistic because the recent research is also showing that over 50% of people with IBS, it's now shown to be caused by SIBO. Moving on to question number four, should you always treat and disrupt biofilms when doing a SIBO treatment? Based on this information and what I've seen in the past working with clients, it may not be always necessary to use a biofilm disruptor, but it seems like using one may be an extremely useful strategy, especially if you've tried treating SIBO in the past and haven't had success. Personally, I'm in favor of doing so in almost all cases. And if you're looking for a biofilm disruptor, check out my Fullscript online dispensary by clicking on the Fullscript link below. You'll get 20% off these supplements as well as 20% off literally everything else you find in the dispensary. And now for the list of my top five biofilm disrupting supplements. Number one, Interface Plus. Note, if you have an egg allergy, this supplement is not appropriate to use. Number two, Ceratiopeptidase. Number three, Biofilm Defense. Number four, N-acetylcysteine or NAC. There's actually a new study done here that shows when using it with Rifaximin, it can be more effective than using Rifaximin alone. This was just published this month in August, 2024. It is a rat model study, so wanna point that out. Do with that information what you will, but still relevant in this conversation. And then last supplement I'm gonna mention is my own personal bloating supplement called Bloat Blocker. It's not actually a biofilm disruptor, but according to research such as this 2018 overview by the International Journal of Molecular Sciences, the active ingredients have been shown to form a protective layer on the intestinal lining, binding to mucin and preventing harmful biofilms from forming. When I mentioned there's some biofilms that can actually be helpful, interestingly, these ingredients from Bloat Blocker seem to actually do that. Per this research study, these results highlight that xyloglucan acts by forming a protective intestinal biofilm that is able to decrease the E. coli load in the intestinal lumen. E. coli is one of the main bacteria that causes hydrogen in SIBO. It goes on to say polysaccharides with film forming properties such as xyloglucan could act inhibiting bacterial biofilms by bacterial competition and niche exclusion. So basically the ingredients in bloat blocker are taking up space and forming these positive biofilms. So bad ones such as ones formed by E. coli can't actually form in the intestine. So the active ingredients in the supplement have shown not only to help with reducing bloating and digestive symptoms, but also potentially help prevent SIBO from forming or returning. To learn more and shop, go to blueorchardwellness.com. And now on to the three major takeaways from this video. Number one is biofilms are extremely common. They're often associated with IBS, SIBO, and various other gut conditions. Takeaway number two, biofilm makes treatment with antibiotics and antimicrobial herbs much more difficult. And then takeaway number three, when dealing with an infection involving the intestine or the intestinal lining, probably a good idea to address biofilms when using a treatment such as antibiotics or antimicrobial herbs. That is all for today. If you enjoyed the video or found it helpful, please like and subscribe to my channel for more related content. Since you stayed till the end, I think you'll want to check out one of these two videos next. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.